Hey guys, it's Samuel from Sora here, and today I'm going to interview Kate from Pink Fits, which is a company that deals specifically with rainbow people to get their lives back on track. You'll love her because she's a dynamo, and she's funny and amazing. So, let's get to it. So thank you so much, Kate, for coming today and giving us a part of your very busy, busy schedule as you are pretty busy <laughs> running pink fits and all that. Mm -hmm. What is your education and what's your occupation currently? My occupation is I run my own business and it's Pink Fits LGBT Health Happiness and Fitness and I started that about three years ago, so that's my occupation and my education. <laughs> It is, I have four different diplomas in um, management, frontline management, nutrition, youth work, community work, and that's five, so I might have five. Um, small business management, so maybe there's six. There's a few. <laughs> I really like learning, so yeah, I keep, I continually learn. That's really cool. Yeah. I read that you were Tasmania's youngest alderman at age 19. Mm -hmm. Can I just start off by asking what is an alderman and what do they do? So it's an elected member for the local government. So as you see our local council in every community, um, the alderman or elected member, depending where you, you are, um, and they work out the, the policies for the community. So much like Noosa Council, we have our council, the policies go through and the, the aldermen get together and make decisions which are best for the community. So in like the like political like monarchy, where would they sit? Grassroots. So, so community based. So if you think you your local community government and then state, which is your state government, and then federal. Yeah. It's the most important I reckon. <laughs> and what made you want to become one? I don't even know. <laughs> um I grew up in a really rough area, a really challenging area, low socioeconomic area. Um, there was a lot of vandalism, a lot of unemployment. There were high level adult, uh, high levels of adult low level literacy and numeracy. Um, we had grandparents who were in their thirties, looking so high teenage pregnancy, um, and the local government where I, uh, the local community where I was working, our young people weren't voting at all. And I was in a position where I was working in community development and um, had started a home ownership program to get long-term tenants from Housing Tasmania buying their own properties to inject more pride and, and ownership into the community. Um, and once I started talking more and more with the community, and also my mum was a very big community leader in the area, um, and once I started integrating more into the community and thinking, wow, I could really make a difference here with being a voice for the for the youth so at 19 I was able to vote I'd never really thought of it because it wasn't a culture within that community um, and I thought I, I can do this you know I had a lot of networks and people wanted someone to look up to and I topped the polls and beat the mayor which was pretty awesome <laughs> yeah but but the, the, it was the highest level of young people voting and the highest level as a whole of my community within that municipality um, who voted. So they got a voice and that was what my, my goal was. They had a voice. That's, so That's really good. Yeah. That's great what you've done. Yeah. And I was excited to read that you were a part of a team that put Pride and Prejudice, pride and prejudice into mm. high schools, which helps combat homophobia. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so, uh, well, this is going back a few years now, Sam, probably 15 years, um, where LGBT issues were not spoken about. So in Tasmania, it wasn't conversations that were had, and it certainly they were not conversations that were had within the school curriculum. Um, I was approached by a guy who was running a program called Working It Out, uh, which was an LGBT organisation, support organisation, who they gathered funding to go into the schools to have three to four um, people, LGBT people, uh, come into the schools and talk about their issues and their experiences of coming out. So um, we went to six or seven different schools 
and it was great. We, we, ha- we, the, the students were able to ask questions. Uh, it was a bit sort of, at times, you know, it was a hard conversation to have. People were a bit shy to ask questions and I like to talk, so I talked lots. But we were able to give positive role models and we were also able to put very normal faces um, to the LGBT community and real life faces. So where they might have only seen Will and Grace, or you know, I don't even think Will and Grace or Ellen was out then, but they had a stereotype and we were able to challenge that and show real life stories, mm. which was awesome. And put much needed like, feedback into schools really, because it yep. was never talked about. Yeah. The interesting thing was that we probably got a little bit more homophobia from certain teachers than any students that walked into that classroom. And that I think was just a generational thing and it is seen now that um, students seem, uh, teachers seem to be a little bit more uncomfortable with this big tribe of gays coming in um, than the kids. And the, you know, the, the students were pretty welcoming really. But we had great feedback with people contacting afterwards because the conversation had been started and that was the point. Yeah. So, yeah. That's really good. Again, that's really good. Yeah. <laughs> so you are the founder of Pink Fits, which is a rainbow fitness organization. <laughs> so why did you start that and why is it important? Um, so Pink Fits is an umbrella for health fitness and happiness so rather than just being like a personal training organization which is how I started um, now I see that I have a role as holistic health um, meaning you know body mind and soul and lifestyle there's far too many people who are unhappy in their lives but not necessarily do they need to go squatting and push upping Um, the way that that came about was that I left Tasmania with a broken heart and a daily drinking problem and I was out further count. I didn't know what to do and I moved to the Gold Coast and I really wanted to connect with other LGBT people but all I found were more bars and more clubs and there were, and I'd stopped drinking. So I moved to the Gold Coast, decided this is it, no more women, no more um, drinking, I need to get my life back on track. So looking for like-minded people, I couldn't find anything and I thought we are really missing some positive influences here within our community. And also growing up, I didn't have anything except bars and clubs. So it was very much a social culture of drinking on the weekend, you meet people and that's how you made friends. So I decided to start the business, with, or a group that then evolved and evolved and evolved and now I have a business. So, um, and it's awesome because it's a way for the community to connect, whether it be online or physical so we do um, meetups locally and in different areas around Australia and also um, online where we have you know people are connecting all around the globe which is they're talking and they're connecting which is great so yeah that's what we need yeah yeah and they're safe might I put that the group is they're safe together they're connecting they're speaking together and it's a positive role model it's not It's not just going out to a bar every weekend and connecting with other people that go out to a bar every weekend, you know. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine, but at least there's an alternative. We need to give people alternatives rather than, you know. And more like a positive, like role model or a positive outlook on life. Yeah, and fun. Mm. You know, the the reason the Mardi Gras is so great is because it's fun. And and sometimes a a lot of the stuff that we're doing in LGBT, um, community, it, we've missed the fun part, and so for us, when we're kayaking out, you know, along here, or we're bushwalking and we're laughing, and being gay is just an aspect of our life. It's not our life. It's a real sense of normal normality and community, and people love that. I love that. Where it's just we're having fun. So yeah. yeah. So, in terms of your sexuality, how do you identify yourself? Lesbian. I am well I sort of call myself a homo actually <laughs> which again is going back and reclaiming that name so um, the our community has a history of going oh you've used that word to you know as an insult in the past so we will reclaim it so you know poof is a is a classic example of the gay community going actually I'm going to take that on um, so I, I will refer to myself and, and through my work I'll say healthy homos so it's a bit of a, mm. a an empowering way to go yeah I am and that word won't hurt me anymore mm. so and it doesn't matter and it doesn't matter so yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, 
Um, when did you know that you were lesbian? This is always a tough question. I came out as such at, at 16. Um, when I look back and with the hindsight now, which is a really thing, that, a really easy thing to do as a 34 year old woman, I can look back and say, I knew when I was in grade two. However, when I was in grade two, I didn't know. I wanted to be like the teacher, you know, and I wasn't interested in boys, nor should I be in grade two, by the way. Um, but I can look back and go, oh, okay, so that thread had built my whole entire life. But knowing what that was, not until I was 16, pretty much. Or grade seven and eight and nine, I started thinking, maybe what what's going on here? Um, because I just didn't feel like the other girls. I wasn't boy raving mad. And if I was, if I was seen like that, I was pretending. Um, but I would read, <laughs> and this is a show of the times, I would read Dolly magazine, which was very much a classic teenage magazine. I would read that and they had a little segment at the back called Dolly Doctor, which would have four questions. Dear Dolly Doctor, what happens if I, um, you know, might be something around their menstrual cycle or it might be something around, you know, I don't have any friends and I'm getting bullied. And every six months there might be one thing where it's, uh, I think I'm attracted to my friend who's also a girl and I would read that answer over and over and over but that answer even said it's probably more than likely just a phase you'll get over it so I waited four years for that phase and then thought probably isn't a phase and came out at 16 um, to my mum and that was hard but even after that because it had been ingrained with this phase thing and that was very much the conversation that was happening in you know, in, in the 90s. Yeah, it, it was always seen as just a phase. So I guess it probably took until I was about 19 before, or 18, 19 before I went, this ain't no phase. And, you know, I'm still waiting at 34 for this phase to, and it's not gonna finish. So, <laughs> but which is really great that now it's not seen as a phase as much as a general broader community statement. It's not It's not there. It's very real and taken ser seriously. And that would be one of the problems when you were younger because if everyone who read that thought it was a phase, yeah. everyone would just be waiting for it to go away. Yes, yes. Because that that's half of the problem yeah. with the LGBT community in the past, because there's been no knowledge. No, that's exactly right, exactly right. No knowledge and not taken seriously and not seen as a real thing. You know, same-sex relationships aren't seen as real relationships. And then we could get into marriage equality, but we won't. Um, and that that's a part of the struggle. So we need to be taken seriously. So, were you a teenager in the 90s? Yes, Sam, I was. <laughs> Where did you grow up? Tasmania in um, Bridgewater Gagebrook, which is a, sorry, it's a community, so as I referred earlier, um, a pretty rough area. And, um, yeah, lots of, so it was a really rough area. And for coming out in that area was probably that scared. Was really scary. scary, yes. Um, you know, there were, I grew up with seeing houses being burnt down and car bodies being torched in the, you know, a couple of streets down and um, fights were, were not unusual. So to come out then was like, oh, yeah, yeah. However, when I was 16, 17, and I did, um, and I'm probably digressing, but when I came out to my mum and there was a young guy who was a few years older than me and had a, a lot of friends in the community and they were rough as guts. But with our community work that we'd done, um, my mum was working with, and I was working within this gang um, and they were known as a gang. And they were pretty rough and pretty tough. And my mum said to the leader of that gang one day, Kate, I, I need you to look after Kate. Um, she's just told me that she's gay and I'm really worried about her. And he went, yeah, and she went, oh, she'd said to him, I need to talk to you about something really seriously. She's come out as gay and I need you to look after her. And he went, yeah, okay. And she went, yeah, so, you know, it's really serious. And he went, yeah, what, what's the serious part? Because the me coming out as gay thing, he didn't even see that that was a serious issue or that I'd need looking after. It just didn't matter to him. And that was a big, tough gang leader man that went, it don't matter, what, what's the serious part here? You know, her being gay is no issue. Um, and that was really good for my mum to hear that no one was worrying in that part then. So, because she again was a generation before me, so it was not spoken about.
Mm. Yeah. So. And can I just ask, was your mum supportive of you being lesbian when she came out? Yeah, so my mum was um, had a range of friends and was a strong community leader and worked in women's health so she'd met other lesbian women and had friends that were lesbian so I thought she's going to be totally cool about this and um and when I came out to she I think she kind of knew and I remember sitting on the floor crying and crying and crying for five hours might I add and her playing this game not a game but saying what's going on are you being picked on is has something happened are you are you not feeling happy or uh, do you think you're gay and I'd said no to all of those things and then um, I kept crying and kept crying and and I said you've already said it and she said so you think you might be gay and I said yeah I think so and it was just so hard to get those words out um, and you know we had the classic she hugged me and it was all okay and then after that she um, it wasn't that she was ever bad, not by any means, but I think she was trying to understand what that was. You know, that was 1997, 98, and there was no Ellen on TV, and there were no books and resources or PFLAG groups, and we were in Tasmania. There wasn't even local people that she knew, well, apart from her friends. She was worried about what what that meant, for, um, sorry, that what that meant for my life. So. Um, yes, she was absolutely supportive, and as it went on over the years, she was 100% supportive and all that sort of stuff, but it still was something that wasn't really spoken about. So, you know, um, I see now parents are talking about it with their kids and stuff. In 1988, no, 1998, 1999, it still wasn't really spoken about, and when I did the Pride and Prejudice um, thing, mum would say that I went to talk to schools about youth issues because it, that was the time. It wasn't Kate's going to a school to talk about being gay because that, that wasn't said. Mm. Um, but supportive, yes, absolutely. That's really good though. <laughs> yeah. At least she was supportive and not. She was supportive, yeah. And, and I, this, I think about this a lot because my mum died when I was 21. So she was just starting she, she, she welcomed, I had a partner when I was 19 and I bought a house and she was very welcoming of that and would, you know, say that this is my partner, not my friend, which was good. She was very supportive in that way. I, a lot of us get the, this is Kate and that's her friend. Um, no, girlfriend, no, partner. Um, and so she was very good in that. If my mum was still alive now, I'm pretty sure she would have a rainbow flag and she would be like the old queer as folk mum that would be pride of all pride um, and at all the rallies and whatever else but we didn't get that far so mm, yeah sad. yeah yeah well I had the best mum for 21 years so I can't complain really <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. so 70% of Australians say in polls that they want equal marriage equality how does it make you feel that the government's like stalling and being slow about getting a plebiscite or a vote <laughs> You know, it's interesting because if I think about it too much, I can get really upset about it because I just don't understand. I don't, and in my daily life, I just don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me why we need to vote on my basic right and why that, especially with the plebiscite, needs to come up for a national vote about who, like, I can't actually fully get my head around it because it's so extremely not okay, you know? Uh, even now I'm struggling to explain how I really feel about that because I just, I can't believe that in Australia in 2017, when Ireland, the Catholic capital, is okay, when Texas, of all places, is okay or, you know, has marriage equality. So it's... It's sad. It's just really sad, I think. And and to feel like a second, if I think about it too much, and actually really feel like a second-rate citizen, and that my basic rights are, and I'm judged on who I love, which I can't control. It's overwhelming, to be honest. It's just a bit, yeah. And also on top of that, how even with like the support of the people as well, it's not just like people do want it. Mm. But the government's just not wanting it, mm. so that's just sad. It's really sad, and I, as I said, I can't understand. The, the thing that I see is that 
as a whole within our community, in the LGBTI community, we're so resilient and we're so understanding and that we're sitting back and going, we're not sitting back because we're very forward as well, but we're sitting there going, okay, we will get there. And you know, you're attacking our heart. You're attacking the, the things that are so wholly us, but all right, we'll keep on fighting and we're gonna to stick together. And yeah, okay, we understand your views, but that, that's not what we're gonna do. We're not gonna destroy marriage. And whoa, well, okay, you attacked us again. Uh, hang on, no, when it doesn't make us bad parents. And, and as a community, that's what makes me really sad is that you're attacking our heart and soul for your own bullshit, because it's, if I can swear, but it, 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 that's just all bullshit. And, it, and it's not good enough and, it, and it's just, we're an amazing community and I have to high five all of us the fighters the everyday people that are just emerging and in, in society and doing their daily thing the people that share posts to the people that are leading rallies to the people that are in government lobbying you know it's all of us and it, and it takes all the different voices I'm just so proud that we're just keeping on going because we will get there <laughs> I hope <laughs> yeah we will and lastly, what advice would you have for rainbow teenagers right now? That don't try and do everything all in one bite and that it just find one piece of connectedness. So find a place, whether it be a group online. So if you're, it, it depends on where you are on the spectrum, whether you are so far in that walk-in closet that you just can't even think about it or whether you're out like me. Um, you, wherever you are it's absolutely okay and that you, you can't do it all in one day but find the connectedness so t find someone online for, read articles find a group um, find someone in your local community that you can connect with because it is completely okay and it is completely normal I, I, if I go back to my own times they were really hard from from 14 when I was trying to work out what the hell this was and how to get through and I would go to the library and get books out on homosexuality because there were only big heavy hardcover books that might have a chapter or um, and I would make up to the librarian that I was doing a study on how to cure homosexuality because that's all the books were there was no how to if you might think you're gay how to be gay how there were no role models there was no Ellen there was no there was nothing there was a Mardi Gras which I would wait every, for 12 months to maybe get a snippet if it was shown on the news which it probably wasn't um, the other thing I did for my point of connectedness which would be my advice was Melissa Etheridge which you probably don't know who she is but <laughs> so she she was a she's a singer and I had her album and, or my mum had her album and when I found out that she was gay it was like oh that's a boy she's singing about women wow so I then would go to the state library because they had a computer that you could rent out for half an hour and I would go into the Melissa Etheridge chat room on a dial-up connection that used to take about 15 minutes to connect to get into this um, Melissa Etheridge chat room where I found other people and they were mainly in America who identified as this thing called lesbian or gay and I would be so scared that the librarian was looking over my shoulder and seeing that I was in the Melissa Etheridge chat room because you, if you were a fan, that meant that you were gay and uh-oh, am I going to get knocked over the head? Am I going to get kicked out? But I'd do it. Every Saturday morning I'd go there and I would chat with these other women and I would feel normal. And that was so much magic for me. And then I found in little old Mississippi another girl that was 16 and ended up chatting to her. Um, and she said, well, you know, what do you identify as? And I said, I don't know. And that was my coming out, was before even I told my mum, that was my coming out. We, I just needed someone that, and that was for me, was her to go, it's totally okay. You know, she'd been out since she was 12 or something. So for me, I went, oh, wow, there's someone like me. And the great thing now is that for, for this generation is that there are so many versions of someone like me because there's someone on TV and there's books and there's forums and there's groups on Facebook and there's support groups in most communities and get out there and find that one point, just one point. It's interesting that you mentioned that because Sora, the website, we now have forums on there mm -hmm. which people can sign up 
well, teenagers specifically, can mm-hmm. sign up, have a profile, put, have activities like, so you know who's joining and you can have forums and mm. have conversations and mm. basically make friends. Mm. And there's also an idols page which has photos and information of a lot of, of numerous gay, lesbian, insects, transgender, mm. bi, like, idols. And we also have the interviews page mm-hmm. which these will all go on as a resource for teenagers. Yeah. Excellent. And that's exactly what is needed because when someone can read a story and there's an element going, oh, I'm not alone. And oh, okay. And it, it, it might be a, a man or a woman or, or whoever with whatever story. But as soon as you get that connection point of, oh, okay, I'm not alone, you can start to build on that. So you can say it's like, it's normal. Yeah, it's totally normal. Everything's normal these days. It's good. That's really good. Excellent. So thank you, Kate, so much for your time. Mm-hmm. And it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.